Thanks very much, Marsh. Um, unfortunately, my talk isn't quite as exciting as all the other ones, as it's actually really here to talk about uh, the regulations and the GDPR itself. Uh, but I'm hoping at the end of this talk, actually, that you will actually find these a bit more accessible and actually easier to deal with in some respects. So, by now, you must all recognize that the uh, GDPR is actually in force, and it came into force on the 25th of May. I'm really not going to speak a great deal about GDPR itself, um, but really just to actually contextualize it a little bit. Data protection is, in fact, not just something that came with GDPR. Um, it is actually considered to be a human right. It is a constitutional right within Ireland, and it also is actually um, a human right within the international law and within European law. So actually, data protection is part of a much wider international uh, framework for the right to privacy. By definition, it's not an absolute right. And it is actually one that has to be balanced against other uh, fundamental rights. So again, today we've been talking about common uh, societal good and so on. So very often when there is actually a requirement to balance rights against societal good, it's actually very important that actually the principles of necessity and proportionality are taken into account. So what are the sort of changes that GDPR has introduced um, compared to before? Well, really, <clears throat> not a great deal, actually, in most cases. Most of the con concepts and principles are the same as was there in the previous data protection directive. Necessity of the data, data minimization principles, being transparent about how data is used, and the concept of consent have all been there before. What is possibly new, um, although it's not precisely a new concept, but it is now enshrined in GDPR, is the concept of privacy by design and privacy by default. So privacy by design, obviously, is where privacy is actually built in to the sort of, um, I suppose, research protocols and your, the operation or the use of data. Um, and privacy by default is where privacy is the fail-safe um, solution or the, the sort of um, backstop, if I might use that term at this stage, um, <coughs> solution that's there. The emphasis is on accountability, and a lot about GDPR is actually introducing in accountability. So what has changed? It's somewhat broader in scope, in that actually the definition of data is broader than it used to be before, and it obviously has a much broader territorial reach. There are stronger rights for individuals and some new rights, but not very many. And there's obviously the, a very significant requirement to notify data protection uh, commissions and data protection offices in cases of breach. And then obviously in some instances where there's actually a very serious breach, you have to actually notify the individuals who've been infected as well. But I think the thing that has probably made most people anxious is the fact that there are actually now significant penalties that can be imposed. And that's really what gives GDPR teeth. And I just noticed that Austria, for example, has now just um, issued its first fine under GDPR. So it's not a very large fine at the moment, 4,500 uh, euros, so it's not huge. But in reality, the pr in, it can actually go up to very large amounts. And in the UK, as a result of the Cambridge Analytica um, episodes that was earlier this year, uh, one of the companies, one of the Canadian companies involved is actually facing a, a fine of up to 17 million pounds. So it really can be significant. <clears throat> I'm only going to show this slide once, uh, very, very shortly. This is actually the title of the new health research regulations. The Data Protection Act 2018, section 36.2, Health Research Regulations 2018. And as you can tell, it's a statutory instrument, which means it's been introduced by the department under the delegated authority that the Department of Health has. So we're, not, we're going to call this the Health Research Regulations from here on in. But just in case you ever need to, uh, to Google it and find it in real life. I just want to contextualize all of the various different uh, regulations and acts that, have, uh, that are actually in place here. So obviously, as you know, the General Data Protection Regulation, it is a regulation, and under EU law, this is the overarching kind of law uh, that applies across the whole of the European Union. 
Unlike the directive, the regulation has direct effect. It doesn't actually require law to be implemented within the member states in order to have its effect. However, there are aspects of it um, that member states have been given um, some flexibility in order to uh, implement their version of the gen general data protection uh, regulation. And in Ireland, we introduced um, pretty much the day before the GDPR came into effect, we had the Data Protection Act 2018. It came into force literally the, the day before GDPR. And <clears throat> so that actually gives effect to certain aspects of the law within Ireland. And then on top of that, in the context of health research specifically, the health research regulations have been introduced. I think it's important to note that actually the health research regulations bring together, and actually this is one of the key points of bringing in those regulations, all of the different pieces of regulation into one place from the Data Protection Regulation, from the Data Protection Act, and it actually puts them into one particular uh, statutory regulation. So that actually it is really to go and actually make life a little bit easier for um, researchers so that they only need to go to one place to actually see what's involved. So <clears throat> as I say, I really want to just try and make the regulations a little bit more accessible. So when you actually open a regulation and, and law, it can be uh, quite daunting to look at. Sorry, actually, it's hard to read some of these, but I'm going to um, uh, call them out anyway. So really, there are kind of uh, five key areas that the health research regulation um, uh, puts in place. First of all, it identifies the mandatory, suitable, and specific measures that are required to be in place in order to be GDPR compliant when you're doing data processing in the context of health research. Secondly, it gives a definition of health research, and I'll actually come back to that a little bit more um, in, in another slide. It also, for the first time, introduced the concept of a, cons uh, a consent declaration for new research, and that is a declaration where consent might not be required. It also introduced, introduces transitional arrangements for current research, and finally, it puts in place the idea of a committee or a consent declaration committee that actually can adjudicate on when it is actually appropriate that a consent declaration can be issued. <clears throat> so firstly, what are the mandatory and suitable, uh, suitable and specific measures for processing personal data for health research uh, purposes? So first and foremost, it must be necessary the data that you're using must be the limited, um, uh, the minimum amount necessary to, in order to go and actually do the, the processing that you require. And it must not cause damage or distress to the data subjects that you, uh, are, whose data you're using. Secondly, you must have in place suitable governance structures um, in order to actually sort of oversee the data processing. So what does that mean? Essentially, it means that you must have good ethical procedures in place. You must have got ethical approval. You must have a training of, a, of people who are going to be processing the data so that they actually are aware of the data protection, um, I suppose, implications of the processing that they're doing, and so on. You must know who your data controller is. If you have a data processor, you must know who that is. And you must be able to identify and inform people who is actually funding the research and who you're going to be sharing the research uh, results with and are you going to be sharing their data. There's a series of procedures and processes and procedures that you need to have in place. These are essentially about accountability, being able to demonstrate that you are actually compliant, making sure that you have appropriate uh, security measures in place, that you have uh, procedures and processes that log who is giving, who's getting access to data. The fourth measure is transparency, and this is actually a key principle of GDPR, and it underpins essentially the, the entire ethos of GDPR. The kind of quick way of saying this is, the data subject whose data you're using should not really be surprised by what you are doing with their data. And so you need to be able to tell them what is going on. And so they need to be aware of it. So things like notices on websites, notices in public places, and so on. 
Part of transparency, for example, in the health context is the patient information leaflets that are being given, uh, along with consent, uh, consent forms. And then finally, and of course uh, not least, you need explicit consent. And really, we see that these uh, suitable and specific measures are really just a codification of established good practices in research and go research governance. So I don't think there's anything new that's involved there. It's just that it's being more strictly, um, I, I suppose, applied now. So we say, why are they mandatory? And why are they not sort of optional? Well, I think everybody has alluded to this in all of the previous talks. This is very much about patient trust and public confidence and support in the health research system. These are things in Ireland that we're very aware of. There has been a lot of, I suppose, trust broken within various um, areas among the health service and so on. So really, it is very important that we actually maintain the public's trust in our system so that they will actually want to partake in health research. At the moment, there is a very, very high interest in um, people participating in health research, and that's actually the way that we want to keep it. These rules really in the health research, I mean, when we put them all together, together in the health research regulations, they provide certainty, consistency, and actually clarity with regard to what you need to do in order to be GDPR compliant. I won't go through this, but as I mentioned, the regulations define what health research is for the purposes of the, of the regulations, so it actually gives you the definition. Um, if I go here, really, I suppose it's actually very encompassing from a health research point of view. It includes experimental and translational research, clinical research, public health research, population, you name it, essentially it covers the gamut. And it's important that it also, to note that it also includes actions taken to establish whether or not an individual may be suitable for inclusion in research. I think it's important to note that while the health research regulations define what health research is in the sort of context of health, it doesn't really define research. But what we can say is that it's not service evaluation, it is not clinical audit, and it is not usual practice, as in usual uh, practice of, of care and uh, caregiving. <clears throat> now, we recognize that there is actually quite a, a lot of overlap between that. And in fact, actually, the uh, department was quite careful in not defining research simply because there is actually a lot of areas where this is quite gray. So we will hope that actually this will become clearer over time. So as I've mentioned, consent is a very key part of, um, I suppose, data processing and having the consent of uh, the patients or the participants and so on. So consent under GDPR is unbundled, that must be separate from other terms and conditions, granular, in other words, you must try and make it sort of specific to various areas and not very, very broad, and we'll come back to that a little bit later as well, because there is some potential for, uh, to have a broad consent as well. It must be named. In other words, you must actually know who you're sharing the data with, who's doing the processing. Um, you must have it documented. So we've talked about procedures and processes already. So the reality is there must be documentation to back those up. It must be auditable. And the important thing is that consent must be easy to withdraw. And essentially, the, what they say is it must be as easy to withdraw your consent as it is to give it. So what is the difference with explicit consent? And the truth is, neither GDPR nor the health research regulations actually define the term explicit consent. But really what it is, is it's an express statement of consent. It is a documented statement of consent. So it is everything that GDPR says consent should be, unbundled, granular, and so on, but it is actually documented. And I suppose my argument would be that you should have no ambiguity that consent has been given for the activity that you are doing or the processing that you're doing. And if you have a question mark there, it means there's a, bit, uh, there's a problem and it is not explicit consent. I put this up to, um, I suppose, show people that the consent that is being asked under GDPR is actually not different, really, from the Data Protection Directive. And you can see the words freely given, 
specific, informed, and unambiguous that are actually used in GDPR have all been used in the previous data protection uh, directive previously. Um, I mentioned, uh, I suppose, certain things that are different with uh, GDPR. So consent by default is something that is no longer uh, valid under GDPR. So you can't really have the opt-out tick boxes, and I'm sure most people here are aware of that now. You cannot presume or imply consent. Um, that is not valid under GDPR anymore. Absolute blanket, uh, unspecific consent is no longer valid. However, there is a possibility of having quite a broad consent in the context of research, and that is something that has been built in to uh, the health research regulations as well as GDPR itself. But a total blanket consent for unspecified future use is not valid. And finally, what was probably not as explicit under the previous directive is the requirement that data subjects are told how to actually withdraw their consent, so that's an important part now. In Ireland, this is always worth, um, I suppose, clarifying, um, consent is one of the six uh, GDPR legal bases, as you probably know, and explicit consent is one of the GDPR's Article 9 conditions for processing special categories of, of personal data, which obviously health data falls in under. However, you can actually process personal data um, and actually special categories of personal data without ever using consent as a GDPR legal basis or using one it as an Article 9 condition either. However, the health research regulations require that explicit consent is in place regardless of what GDPR legal basis or Article 9 condition you are relying on. So what is a consent declaration? Well, actually, it's, a, it's, it's almost like a negative, really. It is a declaration that the explicit consent of the data subject is not required. It is seen to be used in exceptional circumstances only and that it should not be run of the mill. You should actually be getting consent where possible. But it is actually a recognition that, at least especially in health and health research, that actually explicit consent can be very difficult to get in certain circumstances. So when might it apply? Well, I'm going to start with new research, that is research kind of going forward. Well, essentially, it is actually a balancing of rights. And a researcher may apply if the research is of public importance, and that public importance outweighs to a significant degree the public interest in requiring explicit consent of the individual involved. And remember, this is because the consent and the privacy, actually, of the individual whose data you're using is actually a constitutional right. So it is not something that should be discarded with willy-nilly. So that's why, actually, the public importance of the research must be significantly more, you know, must outweigh significantly the public interest of maintaining consent. Secondly, for current research, so these are the transitional arrangements that the health research uh, regulations allow for, we recognise that much uh, research is ongoing, may have consent that is actually under the previous uh, um, data protection directive, but may not be completely compliant with the new GDPR regulations. And so a researcher may apply if they have obtained explicit consent correctly under the data protection legislation that was previously in effect. Um, and you can apply to the Consent Declaration Committee in advance of its deadline, and I'll mention the deadline again uh, in, uh, shortly, um, but you must make sure that you have tried to get consent at this point. And secondly, if you cannot do any of that, if you feel that the public importance of your research outweighs, again, the public interest of requiring explicit consent, again, you can apply to the Consent Declaration Committee to actually have your uh, current consent, um, I suppose, regularised, if, if that be the right word for it. So again, when you aren't getting consent, the reality is it is about public interest. So what are consent declarations? Well, they're not meant to be a fix for past poor research practices, and that's something to take into account. And here, I'm not sure to how many people are here that are strictly from the sort of medical and health research field per se, but in many instances, health researchers 
historically received waivers from research ethics committees. And unfortunately, these do not have any legal effect at this point in time and actually really never had any legal standing historically. So the good thing is that the new consent declarations are now the first time Ireland has introduced a proper legal mechanism in order to actually sort of validly get the equivalent of a consent waiver uh, historically. So this is just technical things. Uh, when is research considered to be current or ongoing? So this is health research uh, that had commenced on or before the 7th of August 2018. And the date that you look at is actually the date of your, the approval of your research ethics committee, the letter that gives you approval. Uh, so that is the, the date line that you use or the reference point. And secondly, there is a transitional period, as I mentioned, but the deadline for that transitional period to apply for a consent declaration for ongoing research is the 30th uh, of April 2019. I'd say anybody who needs that knows has that date imprinted on their, their minds already. So who is going to make the consent declaration? The regulations themselves stipulate that it's actually... Uh, going to be a committee of persons, which is good, um, which will be appointed by the Minister for Health and will, they will have the authority to assess and make uh, consent declarations. What is probably going to be known as the Health Research Consent Declaration Committee will actually comprise of about 15 to 21 ordinary members. It will have a chairperson and two deputy chair people as well. Um, what we would hope, I think, in the, in the future is that actually several iterations of the committee might be able to sit contemporaneously in order to actually deal with quite a lot of, uh, of applications. So there will have to be a minimum of seven members sitting together along with either the chair or one of the deputy chairpersons. Um, obviously, it's really important that people with experience of healthcare and health research will be represented on this committee, but also, really equally important, there has to be representations, representatives from the data subjects themselves. And they must be coming from quite a, a wide variety of, um, I suppose, perspectives, both as a general public as a patient, as possibly even a rare patient, or even other disadvantaged communities. So I think actually that the Department of Health will be looking at how to actually bring all those important perspectives to bear. <clears throat> So essentially, what is the Health Re uh, Research Consent Declaration Committee going to be doing? Well, clearly its most important role is going to be deciding, can it make a consent declaration? And is the public importance of the research being presented to them of, sufficiently, uh, of sufficient public interest that it outweighs, to a significant degree, the public interest of obtaining the explicit consent? So that's their key area. They obviously can make uh, declarations that are subject to various conditions, um, which are likely to um, make sure that um, safety and security measures are put in place. Um, they can refuse to make a consent declaration, and they can revoke consent declarations. Um, obviously, they can request additional information when they're making their deliberations and seek advice from other people. I think what's important is that when you are given a consent declaration by this committee, it is not necessarily going to be a declaration in perpetuity. The bottom line is, as before, privacy by design must be built into your research up front. So there needs to be end of life considerations also. When are you not going to require the consent declaration? And what are you going to do with data after you're finished the project? Are you going to be archiving it? Are you going to be anonymizing it? Or are you going to be deleting it? And when you do not need that data for the process anymore, then the reality is the consent declaration will actually, should end. <clears throat> you will be able to appeal decisions to an independent uh, committee, which will not be members of the consent declaration committee. And I'm not going to spend too long because I can see my time is under a bit of pressure. Um, and obviously, just to let you know, and I think most people here in the room will know, that the Health Research Board is currently in place, putting a secretariat in place to support this Health Research Consent Declaration Committee. But to remember that this committee is not part of the Health Research Board. It is actually a com an independent committee that's going to be reporting to the minister. 
On the Health Research Board's um, guidance, which um, is, is on their web pages, you can see that there is a decision tree that's there. That is actually to help researchers uh, make an assessment whether their research is actually even eligible to apply to the Health Research uh, Consent Declaration Committee in order to go uh, and obtain a, a, a consent declaration. It is not an answer to whether you have sufficient public interest. That is a decision for the committee itself to make. Um, and again, I just want to give people some actions because I realize that um, people are looking to go and try and actually do work so that they're prepared uh, to go to perhaps the Consent Declaration Committee in the future. So first and foremost, there's obviously a lot of information on the, the Health Research Board's uh, web pages about GDPR and about the regulations. There's a lot of frequently asked questions that are answered there already. We recommend that you do consult with your data protection officer uh, within your organization. Um, that is something actually that the Data Protection Commission are very, very strong about doing, that really researchers shouldn't be making independent decisions, that the data protection officers need to know what the issues are so that they can actually start to tackle the issues at a broader level as well. We suggest that you look at the decision tree and see if there's uh, anything that you can be doing in advance. We recommend that you undertake a data protection impact assessment to see just where your risks are and what you need to be doing. Of course, we look and ask you to consider anonymizing your personal data because that obviously helps you to fall out of GDPR and the health research regulations. And where possible and where necessary, try and obtain or try and contact your patient or your cohort um, participants in order to to obtain explicit consent that actually is GDPR compliant. And finally, that's just the link uh, to the Health Research Board's uh, guidance. And that's all I have to say for the moment. Thank you.